Hey guys, my name is Alex Pinson. I'm a senior on VEX Team 4112A out of Zanesville High School. And this should just be a pretty quick tutorial on how we do CAD for our robot and for our design notebook. So for this tutorial, we're gonna be using Autodesk Fusion 360, which in my opinion is the best option for especially this kind of CAD. So Fusion 360 is free for all users. Their license is a little bit weird, but it is free for hobby use, even if it says it may be a paid license. Once your trial runs out, you don't have to renew. Or you can be on an education license. That's what I do. And that gives me a few years free anyways, and I don't have to worry about it. Um, it's also cloud-based. So everything I do on my end, I can save, I can get on another computer, and I can open up the same file. I don't have to transfer it with a flash drive. I can also include multiple accounts on one project. So everyone on your team can have access to the project on their own Fusion accounts, on their own computers, and everyone can work on the robot without having to transfer the file back and forth. So I'm going to cover five main points in this video, and I'll leave timestamps up here on the video so that you can go to each of those individually. You don't have to watch the whole video if you don't need to. I want to talk about five main points, though. The first being our introduction to Fusion 360. The second being the VEX library and their provided parts third being modifying those parts they give you and building your robot, the fourth being joints and actually getting the motion correct in your robot, and finally I'll be showing you how to take pictures and export those so that you can have the actual CAD pictures in your design notebook. Okay, so this main panel right here is called your navigation pane. So it's the pane that's actually going to have your part in the middle. It'll have all of your visual aspects of Fusion. So up here you have what's called the view cube. If you've used Inventor, a lot of this is very similar. So you just have your different views you can click on. You can click and drag to move. But the easiest way to move around in the navigation pane is to use shift and your mouse wheel. So holding shift in the mouse wheel will orbit. Clicking the mouse wheel alone will pan. So that is the easiest way to get around just in here so you don't have to use a view cube, you don't have to come down here and switch commands, which you can do. And if you're using a laptop with just a trackpad, it is better to come in here, but everything is much easier with the mouse. So then we'll come up here. We have the toolbar or the ribbon with all of your tools. You also have different work environments. So model is typically what you're going to be using. Patch is a little bit of a different modeling workspace. Sheet metal you may use some for VEX. Um, rendering we'll use later. Animation you may want to use to make exploded images. Simulation you probably won't use. Uh, manufacturer was previously known as CAM if you used uh, Fusion 360 before. And they just recently changed that in the last update, I believe. And drawing, you can create drawings from these, but I prefer just images. So the next thing we'll do, we'll go over here to the data panel, which is this Rubik's Cube looking symbol that opens that. And you can see, if we go back here, this is probably where it will open. You have all of your different projects. And then within each of those, you can have folders within subfolders. And this is where you'll store everything. So projects can be shared with different people, but I can't decide who gets to see a subfolder within a project. So I can say, you know, this many people get to see this folder, but I can't restrict who can open this folder within the project. So now that we're on to the subject of collaborators, we can go over here to people. And you see, I have about five people in here right now. I can add more here, but you'll see this account right here is the moderator. And what that means is they're the only people that can actually allow people in to the folder. So if I were to type in, I am currently using this account. This is an old account. So if I were to type an email address in here and click invite, I have to switch to this account down here. And when I go to people, I'll see that there's someone to be added. So I can invite them from any account, but I can only actually add them from the moderator account. And the moderator account can't be changed. So a good thing to do is make just a robotics team account. 
and then that account can be accessible by anyone in the future. What I did is I made this folder or this project with an account that I don't even use anymore. Um, so that's sort of an issue when we want to add people because they don't have my email. We'll go ahead and close the data panel and then you'll see we have all these tools up here but to be honest with you and I work a job where I do fusion basically all day while I'm at work and I still don't know where all the tools are up here. Instead I use the toolbox command which is S on your keyboard and that brings up this model shortcuts box. So it's way easier to press S and then type in whatever command you want and I want extrude and find that and use the command as opposed to finding it up here. But that only works if you know what it's called. So just an easier way to do things, at least for me anyways. So the one last thing I wanted to talk about was the difference between components and bodies. And this is pretty important because you can't do a ton with bodies while components are a little more usable. So you can see I have this main level file selected as my active component right now. And that is just the file. Basically it's saying I have the file open and everything is active. So you can see in the top level bodies we have this body one which is our cylinder that I just made. Now let's say with this still selected I wanted to make a rectangle or a rectangular prism. And come here I'll make my sketch and create that. So you can see since I had this top level component selected we end up with two separate bodies. The problem is I can't really do anything with those bodies and if you see it doesn't really let me move the bodies around either. If I were to use the move command I can move them around but I can't click and drag them with my mouse. So let's say I want to assemble these and I want to put this cylinder here on this face. So if I open up my joint you'll see I can't do that because you can only do joints with components. The same is true if I want to do a rigid group, um, which just assembles things in the way they're built, or an as-built join, which also can assemble two things in the way they're built. I can't do any of that with just bodies. So in order to do that and be able to assemble them, I need to make these bodies into components, which is important to do anytime you have separate bodies anyways. So typically a component should only really have one body in it. So here I need to move these two into their own components. It's good to not have any bodies in your top level component here. So you'll see I can right click on it and I have this option to create component from bodies and that moves into a component here. We can go ahead and name that cylinder. We'll do the same here. And we'll just call it that box. So now we have our components created instead of our bodies. And you'll see it now is going to let us move them together and join them. So let's undo that real quick. And it's not really convenient to go into your body and create a new component from that body every time. So a lot of times it's easier to just make a new component. And then we can name it whatever we want. And we'll call this one, say, pipe. So now that created a new component, and you can see you can activate different components. So whenever you're only working on one thing, it's always best to activate just that component and not have your top level component activated. So we'll activate just that component. We can create a sketch, and I'm just going to make a real quick pipe shape. So you can see that's now a component. And right off the bat, we can go ahead and join that to another component without any errors. So typically Fusion will run pretty well on most computers. You can get by with using a laptop for some basic stuff, but as you start to get into bigger models with more parts and sketches especially, which we'll talk about later, you can run into some performance issues. So if you're running on a lower performance computer, one of the things you can do is go to preferences up here. We'll go to graphics on this toolbar and you'll see you can change a couple things that will make your computer run a little better. So you can tune it for better performance as opposed to better display. You can change it to a simple display 
and you can change that to simple. And what that's going to do is it's going to help your computer run better. And if Fusion's running a little slow, it'll give you a pop-up down here, and it'll actually walk you through how to do that. You can also limit effects during navigation to maintain frame rate, and that'll help it run just a little bit faster when you're moving around your model. Okay, so next up, you're going to want to download all of your VEX files. If you already have these, you can go ahead and skip this section. But there are three really good places to download your VEX files. This is the actual VEX EDR curriculum page, and I'll be sure to link to all of these in the description. But this is the VEX EDR curriculum page, and they have Imperial and Metric. But the thing is, they don't have a lot of the parts you're going to want. Um, I've noticed this library is pretty lacking, and I think that the C channel and metal only goes up to like 20 or 25 holes as opposed to a full length 35. So you do have to modify some stuff. They don't have three wide C channel. So there is this forum post here. I'll link to the forum post as well as this direct download. But this has an actual download link for an updated library with a little bit more stuff. Um, and you can look through this forum post because there are a couple more links in here, I believe. And finally, you can go to VEX's website where they have their parts. And I don't know that this is true for every part, but at least for their newer V5 parts, most of them do have the CAD files available for download right here at the bottom of the page under CAD files. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new folder, and this is just going to be our test library. So this right here is just the VEX downloaded uh, just parts library. Um, this is the incomplete one. This is an old one I had on my computer. But for example, if we go to structure, you can see that some of these, um, so these are inventor. So some of these are assemblies and some of them are parts. So the parts you can just upload right in to Fusion. So we'll just go to upload here and we can just click and drag right in. There's our C channel. Go ahead and upload. However, you'll notice that the hinge, for example, is an assembly. So if I try and upload that the same way, just drag and drop. And if I say upload, I have to, I have to select the required parts and assemblies. So all of the components, at least for the VEX, uh, the VEX downloaded library are in this components here and some of them are very clear which assembly they go to some of them are not so I believe you can just select all of these and it will detect which ones it does and does not need for that specific part yeah so you can see it's only uploading the assembly and it does have those in there but I believe when we open it, we won't be able to see them. So you don't have to go and pick out every single one, I don't think. So that's how you upload parts. It's a little tedious to get them all uploaded into Fusion, but once you have them there and you have them in all of their subfolders and organized, it is way easier to find everything. So I have this split up in a couple different things, and some of the names are misleading, like C-Channel. This is just metal. It's not all technically C-Channel. And... You know, shaft things, that's anywhere from spacers to collars, bearings, that kind of thing. Um, so it's not super specific. Organize it however you feel is necessary. One more thing you have to be careful of is a lot of times when you import parts into Fusion that aren't originally Fusion files, it will not carry any parametric references or joints in with that file. So I'm just going to go ahead and save this as test real quick. And if we go into parts and we'll go to wheels, I think some of these are good examples. So for example, this Mechum wheel, uh, if I were to just try and put that in, now if I open the wheel on its own, I can't see this because you'll see that it's kind of difficult for, I can't move individual parts around when it's open on its own. So when I bring it in here, you'll see that all of these parts are disconnected and it would be very, very tedious to put them all back together. So you can go into this file here, the Mechum wheel file, 
and joint them all together. That's one way to do it. Or if it doesn't matter that they move, which in most cases it doesn't, you can use a rigid group. So we'll do that S that I talked about earlier. Just press S, type in rigid group, and we can select all of the components in this case and click OK. And then if we save that, if we save that file, we can go back into our test and you'll see it'll tell us we have an out of date component. Just click here and update it. And then you'll see that we actually can't pull that apart like we used to. It's all stuck together. So that's just one issue you may run into with combining these into Fusion, but it's a quick, easy fix. So like you saw me do earlier, there are two easy ways to add something to a design. So you can just click and drag, and then it will let you adjust and place it wherever you want. Or you can right click on the object over here in the data panel and you can click insert into current design which will do the exact same thing i just like to click and drag i think it's easier okay so now we should be ready to build we have all of our parts in here so we can start getting our parts gathered together for our robot so if we go here and so i've got our devil bot 8 and I'll, this is just a prototype base that i worked on in the beginning of the year we'll get that opened up Okay, so you can see we have our base here, and most of the parts on our base are full length 35 pieces of C channel. And that is actually the only part we have in our parts labor. I don't keep, you know, it, it would be very tedious to have a 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 whole piece of C channel. So I keep the 35s, and then when I need to modify those to a shorter length, I'll include them in our file. And then I can work on that part. So the issue is right now it's linked. So any changes I make over here to this part will change this part. And that comes in handy when we're making an actual robot because I have each individual part created here. And then I will go in and include those all in a master file that's the whole assembly of the robot. That way I can just show individual parts in the design notebook it makes it a lot easier to get pictures so any changes i make to our lift right here i can update in our master file later so we can come back here and that's linked so we can't edit this part in this file if we wanted to change it we'd have to go back to here on the data panel however that would change all of our c channel and all of our parts so we can come down to here on this two chain or this two wide we just brought in right click and we can break the link. This isn't important to do on every single part. So like on spacers or collars or things that I'm not modifying, I will not break the link on. However, on most pieces of C channel, I do. So say we want this to be 10 long. We're gonna come down here and activate the component. Always activate it before you do anything with it. So we'll create a sketch on it. And say we need a 10 long piece, and we also need a hole right here for a high strength shaft. So we'll start with that. We're going to do a line, and this is a construction line, so I pressed X, or you can come up here and make it a construction line. And then we'll do a circle. I'm going to turn construction off, and 0.375, and this is in metric, so I'm just going to type inch. That will give us a hole for our high strength shaft. I'm also gonna make a rectangle right here and just kind of make sure it covers your part. It's not crazy important where this one goes. And then use our coincident constraint. I'm gonna make this line coincident with this point here for wherever you wanted to cut the metal at. So then I can extrude and this will let me select each of those parts and then we can just extrude it back through the part. And that will cut out all of that material. And just press enter. So there's our piece of 10 long, two wide C channel, and we have a hole right in the middle for our high strength shaft. So you can do all kinds of things to modify these. Um, 
Typically extrude is the easiest way to do it, but this isn't a super in-depth tutorial on how to use Fusion, it's just how to get Fusion to work for you with the VEX files. All right, so now that you know how to cut and modify the materials that you get from VEX, we're gonna talk about how to put those together and actually make a robot. So say we've got a piece of C-channel right here, and we've got our wheel there, and we need to attach it to there. So obviously we need a bearing. We'll include that. And bearings are another part that I like to not break the link on because they're probably never going to change um, unless we need to like sometimes we'll cut one right here and make a two hole long bearing but typically I'll just leave those in we don't need to break the link on everything so you'll notice that well this is a round hole and we have a good center point reference for each hole in this Every hole on the C channel is not round, and we don't get that kind of reference there. So you'll see if I do joint, and typically you can just press continue. You don't need to worry about that pop up window. Um, so for now, we'll just do a rigid joint. We don't have to worry about that. You'll see that if I click on this line, I get a nice reference point in the center of the circle. And it's important that you use the right plane, because if I were to use this line, this bearing would be sticking out from the C channel. So if you're having trouble selecting, you know, just this line and grabbing that point, you can click anywhere on a plane and then it will lock that plane in and you can select any of the points on that plane. However, we need a joint on this piece of C channel. So I'm going to break the link of the C channel. And this is very important, especially for when you're moving assemblies from one component, like for example, our lift that I gave earlier. If I'm doing something in the lift and then moving it to a master file, this is very, very important. So always activate the part before you create any sketch on it. So now I'm going to create a sketch on this plane. This is the plane I want to join to, and I'm just going to create a little bit more reference geometry so that I can put that bearing in place. So we're going to come, we'll come over here where the wheels are. And I don't actually have to sit here and draw a point perfectly in the middle of the hole I want it in. I can actually just press P for project. And that's going to bring all of the geometry into my sketch. So I can click this face and then go up here and click OK. So your computer may get a little bit slowed down by the sketches in Fusion slow it down more than anything else. So always be sure, especially when you have a sketch like this, to hide that sketch as soon as you're done with it. Or if you do something with it, it typically is hidden after, say, I did an extrusion, it would hide itself. But if it doesn't, always make sure and hide it if you're not using it, because it will slow Fusion down a lot. So then I'll go back here and activate my main file. We can do our joint again. And whenever you do a joint, it's not a huge deal sometimes, so we'll actually ground this piece of two wide, if it will let me. There we go. So that can't move. So if I grab this, it can't go anywhere. This will move around for me. So whenever you joint something, the first object you click is going to be moved to the second object you clicked. So with this grounded, if I click this first and then click this, this one's going to move over here because this can't move. But it's grounded, it doesn't make a difference. It's just something to keep in mind if you're not working with grounded components. So I'll select that center point, our middle hole there. I'll come down, I want it on this hole. And you'll see now that I've projected that geometry, I get a little bit of reference geometry because it tries to give you all of the midpoints and the center points of different planes and different geometry. So it gives me that, I can click on that. And this is a rigid joint, so this is going to just lock it in place. But it came in upside down, that's not a problem. Come over here, click flip, and it's in place right now. I can move it 90 degrees if I needed to, but 
it's perfect where it is so we'll just click enter and those two are now fixed together they cannot move so then we need to get our wheel onto that so we'll do joint again except this time we have a couple different types of joints rigid locks it in place Revolute locks it in place, except it can spin about the point you select. Slider locks it in place, except it can move up and down in one direction, and you can select which axis you want it to be able to move along. Cylindrical sort of combines these two, so it can slide in the direction you choose, and also spin about the axis that it can slide on. Pin slot allows it to do everything the cylindrical can, so it can spin and move in a direction, but it also gives it one more degree of freedom, so it could move, say, back and forth as well as up and down. If you're used to Inventor, using planar is similar to using the flush constraint, so that just makes two surfaces mate with each other and become flush and stay on the same plane which is actually really handy with these vex parts that have nice flat flush surfaces and finally we have a ball constraint which you will probably hardly ever use but that just makes two points touch and they can move any which way they choose so long as they're touching so for this wheel we're going to use a couple of these just to show you so revolute we will use that one we will select this right here, the great thing about VEX parts is they typically have geometry on them that makes it easy to join, other than the C-channel. So we'll select this right here, select this, that'll bring our wheel down to our bearing. And sometimes assemblies don't come assembled, so even if, like I showed you earlier, even if I did a rigid group on these, when I do the joint, it'll move on its own. But if I click OK, you'll see that it does move with it. So we did a revolute there, which allows us to spin and do nothing else. So we can then edit that joint. And say we change that to a slider. So now you'll see that can go up and down, but it can't spin anymore. We can adjust the angle, but once we finish the joint, it will not be able to spin. Cylindrical combines the two, so it can go up and down, but it is also able to spin once we complete the joint. Pin slot adds one degree of freedom, so it can move back and forth. So you'll see I can move back and forth and rotate. It's kind of difficult to move but it does have a few more degrees of freedom. Okay, so I'm going to turn this sketch off, and it's under too wide where we saved it earlier. So we'll turn that off. And then I'm going to bring in another piece of too wide. So we'll go to parts, C channel. Let's bring in another piece of too wide. Okay, and we'll turn this 90 degrees. So say I wanted a specific hole to be jointed, so one way to do that is to do a rigid, and then we'll just select, say, this point here and the corresponding point on the hole I want it to match up with. That'll give us a good rigid joint. Um, sometimes you're building a robot and you don't know exactly what hole things need to go in, which is great because you can use the planar joint. And then we will select for example, a point on this plane and a point on this plane. And we'll go ahead and flip that. I want it to go that way. So I can move this in any direction as long as that is on that plane. We're going to repeat that joint. Typically, when you do a planer, if you want it to lock in position, you have to use it three times. So I also want the bottom here. Let's see if I can select it from here. There we go. I want the bottom here to be planar with this face. And it'll tell me a joint already exists, but that's okay. I do want to. 
and then that faced them in the direction I wanted. So we'll say OK. And then you'll see right now I'm able to slide this back and forth on this part. So if I didn't know exactly where something needed to go and I was testing different fits, I can slide that back and forth. And then once I do know where it goes, I can use one final planar joint. And I can say a planar between this face and the corresponding face of that hole. And it'll say that twice because I do have two joints between the same components. And it's going to flip it. So right now that's going to create a conflict. So that won't work. Um, that's not how I want it anyways. So we'll just make sure it's flipped the right direction. Click OK. And there you go. That is how you use your joints. And you can assemble all of your different parts in that way. Another important thing you can do with joints is edit their limits. So right now contact isn't on. So for example, if this were a slider joint, I could slide it up and down and it would go through the C channel. So if I want to edit a joint limit and I'll show you with the Revolute joint right now, I can set a minimum and a maximum. And you can either drag these two arrows to set those or you can set them based on degree values, but I'll set them like that. And then you'll see I can only turn this wheel until it hits that joint maximum, and then it will stop. One other thing you can do with your joint limits is creating a rest position. So if I wanted to rest this, say, in the middle at zero degrees, I could say OK. So that will allow me to pull it back, but it will always sort of snap back to the middle. So one last important thing you can do with joints is called a motion link. So say we have this small gear train right here. So we'll go ahead and make our two joints. So we want these to both be revolute because we only want them turning. So I'll go ahead and pick this plane and then our center point there. And then I can select that right there. Go ahead and flip the joint. And we'll just repeat this with the other gear. Now I can turn this a little bit so the gear teeth line up, but you don't have to be that picky. Okay, so now that we have our two joints made, we can do a motion link. And we'll select the two joints we just made. And basically what these say is as, and it depends on the joint. So you'll be able to see all of your degrees of freedom for your joints. But as this one turns 360 degrees, right now this one's going to turn 360 degrees. So the problem is one gear is always going to go the opposite direction of the gear that it's linked to. So one of these needs to be negative 360. And then this gear is also, assuming this is our driven gear, this gear is going to turn three times as fast as this gear because this is a 36 tooth and this is a 12 tooth. So I believe rev six is this. Um, I guess we'll just have to find out. So we can go from 360 to 120. And that was definitely not correct. So we'll change our 360 here to 120 degrees. And you can see we have the proper gearing right here. So then if you had a shaft that was jointed to this gear to turn with the gear, everything would move properly when you moved it in the model. Now, say this part were a functional part of our robot and needed to go in the design notebook. So there are a couple ways to get a picture of this to put in your design notebook. The only issue I have with doing CAD work for your robot is they aren't going to be able to see the actual model. So I talked to a judge about this at our last competition. And even though Fusion 360 is cloud-based, even though I can provide them a link to view the model online, they aren't allowed to use any online materials. So even if we were to give them a link in our design notebook, 
they could look at it, but they wouldn't be allowed to use that in the judging of our design notebook. So the only way we can convey this CAD model is through pictures. So there are a couple ways to do that. The first and easiest being in this CAD environment. So the first thing you really want to do is hide all of your joints. So you can just press this light bulb here. That's one easy way to do it. Sometimes if you have multiple assemblies, you'll have to come in here and say oh, there will be a joints folder here. You have to kind of hunt down all of your joints and hide them all. But I like to just hide them there. And then we can change our visual style to look a little better. So this is currently shaded with visible, visible edges only, which I believe is default. So you can change a couple things. You can change a wireframe if that's the kind of look you're going for. But personally, my favorite for this kind of visual stuff is shaded. So that gets rid of all your lines. It makes it look a little cleaner. And then you can just use a tool called the snipping tool. Looks like this. And you just press new. You can click and drag. And then you can save your picture to your computer. So that is the easiest way to do it. However, there are ways to make it look a little better. So we can jump from our model environment to the render environment. And I am no expert here, but you can do an in canvas render, which will actually physically show you this render screen. Um, so an in-canvas render is one way to do it. This does take some computer processing power. Um, you can also do a render here, and this allows you to change all of your settings. There are things like focus and lighting. There are all kinds of settings you can change here to get a good render. I'm by no means an expert, but you can play around with it and get some decent looking photos. And we have an example of that actually. If we go here, this is a very quick test render I did earlier. Um, however, it does take you into A360 when you open it to view your renders, but you can save them to your computer. So you can see these look a lot more realistic. They look a lot better. Um, they're textured and lighted much more than just the cat environment is. But one last thing you can do is jump into the animation environment and you can't actually show a video but what this can help you do is get some exploded views of different parts so you can I believe manually move these out with transform and then you know you can manually move them apart um, or there's this auto explode and I believe you have to ex you have to select everything There we go. And then we can click auto explode. And that should give us an exploded view of our robot. For whatever reason, that took an uncharacteristically long amount of time to load. So I would suggest not auto exploding, but just transforming them by hand. Uh, but as you can see, it does explode them a little bit. But if you do it by hand, you can kind of customize the view, get it the way you want it for the design notebook. So I would suggest that over doing this auto explode because it took forever for no good reason on my computer. Okay, so we've learned pretty much all you need to assemble your robot in Vex. So let's go ahead and do a walkthrough of how to build a pretty basic base using all of those concepts we just finished talking about. So I've got an untitled new file here. We'll go ahead and first thing we'll do is we are going to save it and we're going to save it to our test library. We'll call it base tutorial. And typically a good thing to do is as soon as you save a file is to create a new component. But since we're going to be dragging in our components, there's really no need to do so. So we'll get our first components in here. We can go to parts and we're going to make our base out of, we'll do some three wide. Go ahead and import that in, and we are going to cut our base down to 30 holes. So we can come here, break our link, and now that that's in, 
we can go ahead and activate our piece of three wide and create a sketch on this front plane. We just want to cut five holes off, so we'll make a rectangle here on these last five holes. And remember to use our coincident constraint to lock it in right there. Go ahead and press E for extrude. Take that back through the C channel. And press Enter. Okay, so now we have our one piece of 30 long 3 wide, and we're going to need four of these. So we can right click here. We can copy. And then we'll go ahead and activate our top level component and go ahead and paste our control V and we'll do that twice more so that we have our full base okay so now we need one piece of full length we'll do two wide as our cross member so go ahead and bring that in and we'll go ahead and get it to about the orientation we need it so turn it over We'll rotate 90 degrees this way. Okay, so we're going to want to ground at least one of our components here. So I'm going to pick this first member we brought in. Right click, ground. So that is locked in place. And we don't need to break the link on this piece of two wide because we're not going to modify it. So it can go ahead and remain linked. So let's get right into it with the joint. And we're going to do a planar joint for now. So we'll get this edge. Going to make it flush with right here. Doesn't matter which point we select. Go ahead and flip it so it's facing the correct direction and press OK. Repeat joint. And we're going to pick the underside of our cross member. And then the top of our grounded piece of three wide. Now we don't know where our wheels or any of our gearing or motor is going to fall. So we don't know where we want this yet. So we're just going to leave that floating as it is. Now we're going to join all of these in place. Go ahead and flip it. We also need to join the top here to our cross member. And you'll notice that selected up and down. That's not what we want, so we'll go ahead and cancel that selection. Make sure we click on this plane. And we're good to go. So now we need to choose which hole we want this to fall in. So I'm just going to space these five holes apart. So we're going to make one of these planes on any of these holes right here. We're going to make it flush with the fifth hole right here on the same part of the hole. And yes, there's already a component or a joint between those components. But that's okay. We can see this is going to create a conflict, so go ahead and flip it. We can press OK. And then you'll see now we have our base members in place. We're going to go ahead and repeat that for these two here. Okay, so now all of our joints are in place. You can see we can still slide our cross member so we can decide where we want it, but all of our structural components are in place as they should be. Now, one thing I do like to do to keep the clutter off here is I'm going to create a new component and I'm going to just call this structural. And then I like to move all of these into there just to keep everything clean. And you'll see when I do that, it gets rid of the grounded component. So I'll make sure that I re-ground that. 
If I were to ground structural, we'd no longer be able to move and adjust this piece here. So we don't want to ground structural just yet. Next thing we need to do is get bearings in place for our wheels and our gearing system. So we're going to focus on just one side of this base as opposed to the whole thing. So we're just going to build this side of our drivetrain. So we're going to need one, two, three, four bearings for our wheels only. And then we'll have two gears, so we'll need at least four more. So we'll say we need eight bearings. So we can go ahead and get those into our part. And I made a mistake just there. Make sure that your main level component is active when you're bringing this in, because I don't want these to be with my structural parts. Okay, so we've brought in eight different bearings. Now we want them on this face and this face here. So we're gonna go ahead and grab this component here and we can see it's highlighted. So we'll go ahead and activate it. Always make sure you activate before you draw on a certain part. So we'll create, there's, so we'll select this face. We can go ahead and continue. Press P for project. We'll need to sort of orbit back to our plane and we just want to project that whole face and hit enter. That should have created the necessary joint references we need to put these bearings on, so we'll go ahead and go to joint, and this time we're going to use a rigid. Go ahead and select the proper plane and the middle hole in our bearing, and we're going to put this one right here. So select the center of our hole, and we'll go ahead and repeat this for each bearing we need to place. Now you can see because I copied this piece of three wide C channel, when I created the one sketch, it created on each component because they're all linked to one another. So that's okay here because the sketches are on the same plane, but if these were facing the same direction, then the sketch would be on this opposite plane here, which isn't a problem because all you have to do you can use the exact same sketch. I can click this point here, and if I want the bearing to be on the other face, you see it's already flipped the right direction, you may have to click flip, but I can click this arrow here and I can actually offset it, and the thickness of this piece of C channel is about 63 thousandths of an inch, so we can just put in negative 0.063 and that will make it flush with this side of the C channel, even though the sketch is on the other plane. It's not what we want though, so set that to zero and flip the bearing. Right here I accidentally clicked the wrong hole, which is not a problem. A quick trick for that is each of these holes is half an inch apart. So if you accidentally click the wrong hole and you don't want to go through the process of reselecting your joint, you can click this offset arrow and I want to offset it one hole so that's negative half an inch and we're good to go. I'm going to stop at those four bearings for right now. So we'll leave these four for later and we can go ahead and turn off this sketch for a moment because it is slowing everything down and only going to get in the way. So turn that off. We have four bearings here, so we're going to place a wheel in between each of these. So we can go ahead and go to parts, and we have a folder for wheels. And we'll go ahead and go with these thinner four inch traction wheels. Again, we're going to do a joint. Go ahead and do a revolute this time for our wheels and select this right here, that's the center of our wheel. And we can go ahead and the joint reference is already there for that. We'll flip our wheel, click OK. Now you can see that this is a component I haven't used before, so I need to go in and edit this file. Once we've got that open, we'll do a rigid group. Select both parts. and click OK. Go ahead and save that. Then we can close it and we'll see it automatically updates us that we need to update our component. So we will do that. 
and you'll see it goes right ahead and computes that rigid group in our other part. Now I want this to be a geared base, so we're going to need a sprocket. So we go to parts, and we have gears and sprockets here. Uh, sprockets, we've got a small six tooth sprocket here. Now what we want to do with this is we're going to do a rigid joint because we want it to move with the wheel. So we can go ahead and join that there to the center point and flip it. So the issue here is it's not where it should be. So what we can do is we can click, okay, we're gonna click I for inspect. And we're gonna measure the distance from this plane to the center point that we join it to there. You can see our distance is 0.313. We can go ahead and copy that. We'll go back down here in our timeline, click on our joint, and we're going to offset it that value. That puts our sprocket in exactly the place we need it to be. And you can see it also moves with our wheel because they're on the same shaft. We're going to need another sprocket, so we may as well go ahead and bring that in now. And let's say I want a three to one gearing. So we'll bring in our 36 tooth gear and our 12 tooth gear. A three to one gear ratio means that this gear here is going to be driving our wheel and our smaller 12 tooth gear is going to be driven by our motor. And the way we get three to one is three rotations of this gear mean one rotation of this gear. Let's go ahead and turn our sketch back on because we need to join these gears. So we'll turn that sketch back on so we can see. We'll do one more joint and I'm gonna go ahead and capture the position so not everything moves back to where it was earlier. Select our center point of our gear and we'll go a little away from the wheel to this hole right here. Same thing with this gear here. One mistake I made it was I forgot to set this as a revolute so I can just go back and edit the joint. And that's all good to go. Now let's go ahead and set all of our motion links for this. So we'll select our two revolute joints. One of them needs to be negative. This is rev 20, so as this gear turns three times, this gear needs to turn one. So we'll go ahead and do 360 degrees times three. Click OK. And turn our sketch off because we're done with it for now. So as we manipulate this, you can see they turn the correct amount. Now we're going to do another motion link. We'll select this and the revolute we put on our wheel. But they need to be spinning the same direction. And because we put the joints on in opposite directions, we do need to make one of these negative. And that will make them spin in the correct direction. One last motion link, we want our wheels to spin together, even though they aren't chained. Typically when one wheel moves, the other wheel will move with it. Put our sprocket on. And we're gonna do a rigid again, flip it, and remember that we have to move it out 63 thousandths.
one annoying thing, and this goes for most CAD programs, is there's really no way to add chain to it and joint it in a way that it will move correctly. So we can't actually put chain on this. We can just denote that when we put the pictures in our CAD notebook, but we can't add motion links so that they move together properly. You may have realized I forgot to add bearings, and that's not a problem for this gear right here because we're going to add the bearing on the outside, and the other side will have a motor, so it does not need a bearing. But here, we do need a bearing, and that's not really a problem because we can just edit our revolute joint and fix that. So we need to know the thickness of our bearing, so we'll press I for inspect and measure from there to there, and it's a quarter inch thick. So we're going to take our revolute joint. And we can go ahead and edit joint. And we're going to extend that out a quarter inch. Now you'll see that does also offset our rigid joint. So we can edit that. And it's offset 0.063. But remember, we also need to offset it the quarter inch that we just moved it back. For the purpose of this video, I'm not worried about the fact that these gear teeth aren't completely meshing. I'm happy with that gear sitting there and putting the bearing on the outside. So we'll need to turn our sketch back on and add these bearings. We do need a couple things like collars and spacers, so we'll go ahead and bring those in. It looks like this little 1 8 spacer is what we're going to need in between this wheel and this wheel. And then we'll need collars for the ends of our shaft. So the shaft that's in the motor will only need a collar on this face, so that's one collar. And then we'll put one both here and here on this shaft. So that's three, four, five, six, and seven. So we need seven collars for this side and two eighth inch spacers. So we can go ahead and start putting those collars in places. And these are locked to move with the shaft as well, so we're going to use a rigid joint. Now in the case of this collar here, it's going to be easier for me to use two joints rather than jointing it to this wheel that spins and then trying to measure and offset it. So instead, we're going to use a cylindrical joint and I'm just going to join it right there. Perfect. And then what we can do is we can slide it out here and we can use a different joint called the planar joint. And then we can make that flush with this part right here. That takes care of our collars. Now we can put the spacers on. And the type of joint you use for these doesn't really matter. Uh, spacers are sort of free spinning around a shaft, so you can make them rigid to the wheel if you want them to spin, or you can just make it a revolute. I'm just going to make it a rigid, but it really does not matter at all. Okay, so we have most of the base put together now. All we need to add are the shafts and the motor, and then we can go ahead and place this crossbeam. 
So let's bring all of those things in. We have a 12 inch shaft, which is full length. That's all that we really keep our full length parts. So we need four of those, two for the wheels and two for the gears. Now these shafts are going to need trim later, so I am going to break the link to all of them. And I have to do that one at a time. So the way I like to handle the joints for the shafts is to do a revolute. And typically I like to pick a point that's on the side I'm not going to trim. So I like to trim all of my shafts at once. So I'm going to make it flush with this piece of metal here. So we'll go ahead and select our shaft and join it right there. Go ahead and flip it. And then remember to offset it through the C channel. Now, if you want to get picky, you can play with the angle and make sure that it actually fits inside the insert of the wheel. But for the intents and purposes of this video, I'm not concerned with that. So then we're going to do an as-built joint. And we're going to make sure that that is actually a rigid. So what that does is the center of the wheel is actually larger than the shaft. So instead of having to measure that and calculate how far you need to offset the joint so that the shaft's actually in the middle, we can just make sure that they're all centered around the same axis, which is the center of this point. And then we can just do an as-built. And that takes into account that there's space in between the two, but it doesn't care. And it just fixes them together with space in between them. So we'll go ahead and do the same thing for each one of these shafts. Okay, so we have all of our shafts jointed, and as you can see, everything is moving as it should be. And one of the last things we need to do is add our motor in. I have this V5 folder here that has the new smart motors in it. Let's drag the motor in. We need to turn our sketch back on. So you can see we have a slight problem here. What I should have done is put the motor on first and then jointed the shaft to it so that we don't have this gap here. But that's not too bad of a fix. So what we could do is edit this revolute here and just simply push it back further until it was in the motor and you can't see the end of it. But what I would do is actually change this revolute joint to a cylindrical joint. That allows it to move back and forth like so. But because we made this as-built joint between the shaft and the gear, we need to change that, which is this here. So instead of actually deleting it, we can just drag it to the end here. And then we'll need to go right before it, and we'll need to create another joint. This time it'll be a planar. We're going to do a planar joint between the end of this shaft and the back of the motor. We can click OK. And now you can see that if we go to the end of the timeline, it'll create that as-built joint with the shaft shifted back into the motor like we want it. Turn our structural back on. This bearing is no longer needed. And now that we know where everything is, we can go ahead and put our cross member in place. 
So we'll go ahead and move it to about where we want it. So it needs to be ahead of this gear. We're going to put it right there. So then we can do another joint, capture the position so it doesn't push our beam back. And we'll, this one will be a planer because we already have two planers in place. One more will lock it in. And we'll select this back plane and this corresponding plane. And there are already two joints, but we can click yes twice. And that is not what we want, so we'll flip it. And there we go. So the only thing left to do is trim our shafts. And that's not too difficult. The way I like to do it is to just create a sketch somewhere on the front. So we'll pick this plane here. We can see that we want to trim our shafts about right there. So we're going to create a rectangle. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just needs to cover the shaft. Now that we've got the rectangle drawn, we'll need to press P to project, and we're going to project this line here. We can go ahead and make this line collinear with the one we just projected. And that's going to make sure our cut is flush with our collars. We can extrude this entire rectangle all the way back. And that trims all of our shafts for us. Go ahead and turn off joints so we can see a little bit. And there we go. There's one half of our base with all of the motion and joints working. Now this tutorial was more focused towards trying to learn how to use Fusion 360 with the provided VEX files, but if you're learning to get more in depth in Fusion 360 or you have a super specific problem you're having with your VEX CAD and you just need to learn more about Fusion 360, a great resource is NYC CNC, and I'm a bit partial because I do work there, but we post tons of content on Fusion 360 and machining and engineering and business and entrepreneurship, and it's a great place to learn all kinds of Fusion 360. So in addition to our website, NYC CNC, we also have our YouTube channel under the same name, and we post even more videos on machining and engineering and Fusion 360, business and entrepreneurship. So all the same stuff you can find on our site can also be found on our YouTube channel. So if you're looking to learn more, that is a great resource to do so.